Chapter One of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. Chapter One The Tapis Franc. Note One Tapis Franc. Literally, a free carpet. A low haunt equivalent to what in English slang is termed a boozing ken it was on a cold and rainy night towards the end of october eighteen thirty eight that a tall and powerful man with an old broad-brimmed straw hat upon his head and clad in a blue cotton carter's frock which hung loosely over the trousers of the same material crossed the pont au change and darted with a hasty step into the cite that labyrinth of obscure narrow and winding streets which extends from the palais de justice to notre dame although limited in space and carefully watched this quarter serves as the lurking-place or rendezvous of a vast number of the very dregs of society in paris who flock to the tapis franc this word in the slang of theft and murder signifies a drinking-shop of the lowest class a returned convict who in this foul phraseology is called an ogre or a woman in the same degraded state who is termed an ogress generally keeps such cribs frequented by the refuse of the parisian population freed felons thieves and assassins are their familiar guests if a crime is committed it is here in this filthy sewer that the police throws its cast net and rarely fails to catch the criminal it seeks to take on the night in question the wind howled fiercely in the dark and dirty gullies of the cite the blinking and uncertain light of the lamps which swung to and fro in the sudden gusts were dimly reflected in pools of black slush which flowed abundantly in the midst of the filthy pavement the murky coloured houses which were lighted within by a few panes of glass in the warm eaten casements overhung each other so closely that the eaves of each almost touched its opposite neighbour so narrow were the streets dark and noisome alleys led to staircases still more black and foul and so perpendicular that they could hardly be ascended by the help of a cord fixed to the dank and humid walls by holdfasts of iron stalls of charcoal sellers fruit sellers or vendors of refuse meat occupied the ground floor of some of these wretched abodes notwithstanding the small value of their commodities the fronts of nearly all these shops were protected by strong bars of iron a proof that the shopkeepers knew and dreaded the gentry who infested the vicinity the man of whom we have spoken having entered the rue aux fèves which is in the centre of the cité slackened his pace he felt he was on his own soil the night was dark and strong gusts of wind mingled with rain dashed against the walls ten o'clock struck by the distant dial of the palais de justice women were huddled together under the vaulted arches deep and dark like caverns some hummed popular airs in a low key others conversed together in whispers whilst some dumb and motionless looked on mechanically at the wet which fell and flowed in torrents the man in the carter's frock stopping suddenly before one of these creatures silent and sad as she gazed seized her by the arm and said ha ah, good evening la goualeuse note two sweet-throated in reference to the tone of her voice the girl receded saying in a faint and fearful tone good evening chourineur note three one who strikes with a knife the stabber or a slasher don't hurt me this man a liberated convict had been so named at the hulks now i have you said the fellow you must pay me the glass of tape au daf, or i'll make you dance without music he added with a hoarse and brutal laugh oh heaven i have no money replied goualeuse trembling from head to foot for this man was the dread of the district if you're stumped the ogress of the tapis franc will give you tit for your pretty face she won't i already owe her for the clothes i am wearing what you want to shirk it shouted the chourineur darting after la goualeuse who had hid herself in a gully as murk as midnight now then my lady i've got you said the vagabond after groping about for a few moments and grasping in one of his coarse and powerful hands a slim and delicate wrist and now for the dance i promised you no it is you who shall dance was uttered by a masculine and deep voice a man is you bras rouge speak why don't you and don't squeeze so hard i am here in the entrance to your ken and you it must be 
tis not but a rouge said the voice oh isn't it well then if it is not a friend why here goes at you exclaimed the chourineur but whose bit of a hand is it i have got hold of it must be a woman's it is the fellow to this responded the voice and under the delicate skin of this hand which grasped his throat with sudden ferocity the chourineur felt himself held by nerves of iron la goualeuse who had sought refuge in this alley and lightly ascended a few steps paused for an instant and said to her unknown defender thanks sir for having taken my part the chourineur said he would strike me because i could not pay for his glass of brandy but i think he only jested now i am safe pray let him go take care of yourself for he is the chourineur if he be the chourineur i am a bully boy who never knuckles down exclaimed the unknown all was then silent for a moment and then were heard for several seconds in the midst of the pitchy darkness sounds of a fierce struggle who the devil is this then said the ruffian making a desperate effort to free himself from his adversary whose extraordinary power astonished him now then now you shall pay both for la goualeuse and yourself he shouted grinding his teeth pay yes i will pay you but it shall be with my fists and it shall be cash in full replied the unknown if said the chourineur in a stifled voice you do but let go my neckcloth i will bite your nose off my nose is too small my lad and you haven't light enough to see it come under the hanging glim there note four under the lamp called reverbère that i will replied the unknown for then we may look into the whites of each other's eyes he then made a desperate rush at the chourineur whom he still held by the throat and forced him to the end of the alley and then thrust him violently into the street which was but dimly lighted by the suspended street lamp the bandit stumbled but rapidly recovering his feet he threw himself furiously upon the unknown whose slim and graceful form appeared to belie the possession of the irresistible strength he had displayed after a struggle of a few minutes the chourineur although of athletic build and a first-rate champion in a species of pugilism vulgarly termed the savate found that he had got what they call his master the unknown threw him twice with immense dexterity by what is called in wrestling the leg pass or crook unwilling however to acknowledge the superiority of his adversary the chourineur boiling with rage returned again to the charge then the defender of la goualeuse suddenly altering his mode of attack rained on the head and face of the bandit a shower of blows with his closed fist as hard and heavy as if stricken by a steel gauntlet these blows worthy of the admiration of jem belcher dutch sam tom crib or any other celebrated english pugilist were so entirely different from the system of the savate that the chourineur dropped like an ox on the pavement exclaiming as he fell i'm floored mon linge est la vie mon dieu mon dieu have pity on him exclaimed la goualeuse who during the contest had ventured on the threshold of the alley adding with an air of astonishment but who are you then except the schoolmaster and skeleton there is no one from the rue st eloi to notre dame who can stand against the chourineur i thank you very very much sir for indeed i fear that without your aid he would have beaten me the unknown instead of replying listened with much attention to the voice of this girl perhaps a tone more gentle sweet and silvery never fell on human ear he endeavoured to examine the features of la goualeuse but the night was too dark and the beams of the street lamp too flickering and feeble after remaining for some minutes quite motionless the chourineur shook his legs and arms and then partly rose from the ground pray be on your guard exclaimed the goualeuse retreating again into the dark passage and taking her champion by the arm take care or he will have his revenge on you don't be frightened my child if he has not had enough i have more ready for him the brigand heard these words thanks he murmured i am half throttled and one eye is closed that is quite enough for one day some other time perhaps when we may meet again what not content yet grumbling still said the unknown with a menacing tone no no not at all i do not grumble in the least you have regularly served me out you are a lad of metal said the chourineur in a coarse tone but still with that sort of deference which physical superiority always finds in persons of his grade 
you are the better man that's clear well except the skeleton who seems to have bones of iron he is so thin and powerful and the schoolmaster who could eat three herculeses for his breakfast no man living could boast of having put his foot on my neck well and what then why now i have found my master that's all you will find yours some day sooner or later everybody does one thing however is certain now that you are a better man than the chourineur you may go your length in the cité all the women will be your slaves ogres and ogresses will give you credit if it is only for fear you may be a king in your own way but who and what are you you patter flash like a family man if you are a prig i'll have nothing to do with you i have used the knife it is true because when the blood comes into my eyes i see red and i must strike in spite of myself but i have paid for my slashing by going to the hulks for fifteen years my time is up and i am free from surveillance i can now live in the capital without fear of the beaks and i have never prigged have i la goualeuse no he was never a thief said the girl come along then and let us have a glass of something together and i'll tell you who i am said the unknown come don't let us bear malice bear malice devil a bit you are master i confess it you do know how to handle your fists i never knew anything like it thunder and lightning how your thumps fell on my sconce i never felt anything like it yours is a new game and you must teach it to me i will recommence whenever you like not on me though thank ye not on me exclaimed the chourineur laughing your blows fell as if from a sledge-hammer i am still giddy from them but do you know bras rouge in whose passage you were bras rouge said the unknown who appeared disagreeably surprised at the question adding however with an indifferent air i do not know bras rouge is he the only person who inhabits this abode it rained in torrents and i took shelter in the alley you meant to beat this poor girl and i have thrashed you that's all you're right i have nothing to do with your affairs bras rouge has a room here but does not occupy it often he is usually at his estaminet in the champs elysees but what's the good of talking about him then turning to the goualeuse on my word you are a good wench and i would not have beaten you you know i would not harm a child it was only my joke never mind it was very good of you not to set on this friend of yours against me when i was down and at his mercy come and drink with us he pays for all by the way my trump said he to the unknown what say you instead of going to tipple shall we go and have a crust for supper with the ogress at the white rabbit it is a tapis franc with all my heart i will pay for the supper you'll come with us goualeuse inquired the unknown thanks sir she replied but after having seen your struggle it has made my heart beat so that i have no appetite pooh pooh one shoulder of mutton pokes the other down said the chourineur the cookery at the white rabbit is first-rate the three personages then in perfect amity bent their steps together towards the tavern during the contest between the chourineur and the unknown a charcoal seller of huge size ensconced in another passage had contemplated with much anxiety the progress of the combat but without attempting to offer the slightest assistance to either antagonist when the unknown the chourineur and the goualeuse proceeded to the public-house the charcoal man followed them the beaten man and the goualeuse first entered the tapis franc the unknown was following when the charcoal man accosted him and said in a low voice in the german language and in a most respectful tone of remonstrance pray your highness be on your guard the unknown shrugged his shoulders and rejoined his new companion the charcoal dealer did not leave the door of the cabaret but listened attentively and gazed from time to time through a small hole which had been accidentally made in the thick coat of whitening with which the windows of such haunts as these are usually covered on the inside End of chapter one Chapter Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume One by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Two, The Ogress. The White Rabbit is situated in the centre of the Rue aux Fèves. 
this tavern occupies the ground floor of a lofty house the front of which is formed by two windows which are styled a guillotine hanging from the front of the door leading to a dark and arched passage was an oblong lamp on the cracked panes of which were written in red letters nightly lodgings here the chourineur the unknown and the goualeuse entered into a large but low apartment with the ceiling smoked and crossed by black rafters just visible by the flickering light of a miserable suspended lamp the cracked walls formerly covered with plaster were now ornamented in places with coarse drawings or sentences of flash and obscenity the floor composed of earth beaten together with saltpetre was thick with dirt an armful of straw an apology for a carpet was placed at the foot of the ogress's counter which was at the right hand of the door just beneath the dim lantern on each side of this room there were six tables one end of each of which was nailed to the wall as well as the benches on either side of them at the farther end was a door leading to a kitchen on the right near the counter was a passage which led into a den where persons slept for the night at three halfpence a head a few words will describe the ogress and her guests the lady was called mother ponice her triple trade consisted in letting furnished apartments keeping a public house and lending clothes to the miserable creatures who infest these foul streets the ogress was about forty years of age bulky fat and heavy she had a full colour and strong symptoms of a beard her deep voice her enormous arms and coarse hands betokened uncommon strength she wore on her cap a large red and yellow handkerchief a shawl of rabbit skin was crossed over her bosom and tied behind her woollen gown fell upon black wooden shoes scorched almost black by the small stove at which she warmed her feet and to crown her beauty she had a copper complexion which the use of strong liquors had materially tended to heighten the counter covered with lead was decked with jugs with iron hoops and various pewter measures in an open cupboard fastened to the wall there were several flasks of glass so fashioned as to represent the pedestrian figure of the emperor these bottles contained sundry cordials red and green in colour and known by the names of drops for the brave ratafia of the column etc etc a large black cat with green eyes was sitting near the ogress and seemed the familiar demon of the place then in strange contrast a holy branch of boxwood bought at church by the ogress was suspended at the back of an old cuckoo clock two marvellously ill-favoured fellows with unshaven beards and their garb all in tatters hardly tasted of the pitcher of wine before them and conversed together in low voices and with uneasy aspect one of the two very pale and livid pulled from time to time his shabby skull cap over his brows and concealed as much as possible his left hand and even when compelled to use it he did so with caution further on there was a young man hardly sixteen years of age with beardless chin and a countenance wan wrinkled and heavy his eyes dull and his long black hair straggling down his neck this youthful rake the emblem of precocious vice was smoking a short black pipe his back was resting against the wall and his two hands were in the pockets of his blouse and his legs stretched along the bench he did not cease smoking for a moment unless it was to drink from a canican of brandy placed before him the other inmates of the tapis franc men and women presented no remarkable characteristics there was the ferocious or embruted face the vulgar and licentious mirth but from time to time there was a deep and dull silence such were the guests of the tapis franc when the unknown the chourineur and the goualeuse entered these three persons play such important parts in our recital that we must put them in relief the chourineur was a man of lofty stature and athletic make with hair of a pale brown nearly white thick eyebrows and enormous whiskers of deep red the sun's rays misery and the severe toil of the galleys had bronzed his skin to that deep and olive hue which is peculiar to convicts in spite of his horrible nickname his features did not express ferocity but a sort of coarse familiarity and irrepressible audacity we have said already that the chourineur was clothed in trousers and frock of blue cotton and on his head he had one of those large straw hats usually worn by workmen in timber yards and barge emptiers the goualeuse was perhaps about sixteen and a half years old a forehead of the purest and whitest surmounted a face of perfect oval and angel-like expression 
a fringe of eyelids so long that they curled slightly half veiled her large blue eyes which had a melancholy expression the down of early youth graced cheeks lightly coloured with a scarlet tinge her small and rosy mouth which hardly ever smiled her nose straight and delicately chiselled her rounded chin had in their combined expression a nobility and a sweetness such as we can only find in the most beautiful of raphael's portraits on each side of her fair temples was a band of hair of the most splendid auburn hue which descended in luxuriant ringlets half way down her cheeks and was then turned back behind the ear a portion of which ivory shaded with carnation was thus visible and was then lost under the close folds of a large cotton handkerchief with blue checks tied as it is called en marmotte her graceful neck of dazzling whiteness was encircled by a small necklace of grains of coral her gown of brown stuff though much too large could not conceal a charming form supple and round as a cane a worn-out small orange-coloured shawl with green fringe was crossed over her bosom the lovely voice of the goualeuse had made a strong impression on her unknown defender and in sooth that voice so gentle so deliciously modulated and harmonious had an attraction so irresistible that the horde of villains and abandoned women in the midst of whom this unfortunate girl lived often begged her to sing and listened to her with rapture the goualeuse had another name given doubtless to the maiden sweetness of her countenance she was also called fleur de marie the defender of la goualeuse we shall call the unknown rodolphe appeared about thirty-six years of age his figure tall graceful and admirably proportioned yet did not betoken the astonishing vigour which he had displayed in his rencounter with the chourineur it would have been difficult to assign a decided character to the physiognomy of rodolphe certain wrinkles in his forehead betokened a man of meditation and yet the firm expression of his mouth the dignified and bold carriage of the head assured us of a man of action whose physical strength and presence of mind would always command an ascendancy over the multitude in his struggle with the chourineur rodolphe had neither betrayed anger nor hatred confident in his own strength his address and agility he had only shown a contempt for the brute beast which he subdued we will finish this bodily picture of rodolph by saying that his features regularly handsome seemed too beautiful for a man his eyes were large and of a deep hazel his nose aquiline his chin rather projecting his hair bright chestnut of the same shade as his eyebrows which were strongly arched and his small moustache which was fine and silky thanks to the manners and the language which he assumed with so much ease rodolph was exactly like the other guests of the ogress round his graceful neck as elegantly modelled as that of the indian bacchus he wore a black cravat carelessly tied the ends of which fell on the collar of his blue blouse a double row of nails decorated his heavy shoes and except that his hands were of most aristocratic shape nothing distinguished him from the other guests of the tapis franc though in a moral sense his resolute air and what we may term his bold serenity place an immense distance between them on entering the tapis franc the chourineur laying one of his heavy hands on the shoulders of rodolphe cried hail the conqueror of the chourineur yes my boys this springald has floored me and if any young gentleman wishes to have his ribs smashed or his knob in chancery even including the schoolmaster and the skeleton here is their man i will answer for him and back him at these words all present from the ogress to the lowest ruffian of the tapis franc contemplated the victor of the chourineur with respect and fear some moving their glasses and jugs to the end of the table at which they were seated offered rodolph a seat if he were inclined to sit near them others approached the chourineur and asked him in a low voice for the particulars of this unknown who had made his entrance into their world in so striking a manner then the ogress accosting rodolph with one of her most gracious smiles a thing unheard of and almost deemed fabulous in the annals of the white rabbit rose from the bar to take the orders of her guest and know what he desired to have for the refreshment of his party an attention which she did not evince either to the schoolmaster or the skeleton two fearful ruffians who made even the chourineur tremble one of the men with the villainous aspect whom we have before described as being very pale hiding his left hand and continually pulling his cap over his brows leaned towards the ogress who was carefully wiping the table where rodolph had taken his seat and said to her in a hoarse tone 
hasn't the gros boiteux been here to-day no said mother ponisse nor yesterday yes he came yesterday was calabash with him the daughter of martial who was guillotined you know whom i mean the martials of the ile de ravageur what do you take me for a spy with your questions do you think i watch my customers said the ogress in a brutal tone i have an appointment to-night with the gros boiteux and the schoolmaster replied the fellow we have some business together that's your affair a set of ruffians as you are all together ruffians said the man much incensed it is such ruffians you get your living by will you hold your jaw said the amazon with a threatening gesture and lifting as she spoke the pitcher she held in her hand the man resumed his place grumbling as he did so the gros boiteux has perhaps stayed to give that young fellow germain who lives in the rue du temple his gruel said he to his companion what do they mean to do for him no not quite but to make him more careful in future it appears he has blown the gaff in the job at nantes so bras rouge declares why that is gros boiteux's affair he has only just left prison and has his hands full already fleur de marie had followed the chourineur into the tavern of the ogress and he responding to a nod given to him by the young scamp with the jaded aspect said ah barbillon what pulling away at the old stuff yes i would rather fast and go barefoot any day than be without my drops for my throttle and the weed for my pipe said the rapscallion in a thick low hoarse voice without moving from his seat and puffing out volumes of tobacco smoke good evening fleur de marie said the ogress looking with a prying eye on the clothes of the poor girl clothes which she had lent her after her scrutiny she said in a tone of coarse satisfaction it's really a pleasure so it is to lend one's good clothes to you you are as clean as a kitten or else i would never have trusted you with that shawl such a beauty as that orange one is i would never have trusted it to such gals as tourneuse and boulotte but i have taken every care on you ever since you came here six weeks ago and if the truth must be said there is not a tidier nor more nicer girl than you in all the cite that there ain't though you be always so sad-like and too particular the goualeuse sighed turned her head and said nothing why mother said rodolph to the old hag you have got some holy box would i see over your cuckoo and he pointed with his finger to the consecrated bough behind the old clock why you heathen would you have us live like dogs replied the ogress then addressing fleur de marie she added come now goualeuse tip us one of your pretty little ditties goualante supper supper first mother ponisse said the chourineur well my lad of wax what can i do for you said the ogress to rodolph whose good will she was desirous to conciliate and whose support she might perchance require ask the chourineur he orders i pay well then said the ogress turning to the bandit what will you have for supper you bad lot two quarts of the best wine at twelve sous three crusts of wheaten bread and a harlequin said the chourineur after considering for a few moments what he should order note five a harlequin is a collection of odds and ends of fish flesh and fowl after they come from table which the parisian providing for the class to which the chourineur belongs finds a profitable and popular composition ah you are a dainty dog i know and as fond as ever of them harlequins well now goualeuse said the chourineur are you hungry no chourineur would you like anything better than a harlequin my lass said rodolph no i thank you i have no appetite come now said the chourineur with a brutal grin look my master in the face like a jolly wench you have no objection i suppose the poor girl blushed and did not look at rodolph a few moments afterwards and the ogress herself placed on the table a pitcher of wine bread and a harlequin of which we will not attempt to give an idea to the reader but which appeared most relishing to the chourineur for he exclaimed dieu de dieu what a dish what a glorious dish it is a regular omnibus there is something in it to everybody's taste those who like fat can have it so can they who like lean 
as well as those who prefer sugar and those who choose pepper there's tender bits of chicken biscuit sausage tarts mutton bones pastry crust fried fish vegetables woodcock's heads cheese and salad come eat goualeuse eat it is so capital you have been to a wedding breakfast somewhere this morning no more than on other mornings i ate this morning as usual my half-porth of milk and my half-porth of bread the entrance of another personage into the cabaret interrupted all conversation for a moment and everybody turned his head in the direction of the newcomer who was a middle-aged man active and powerful wearing a loose coat and cap he was evidently quite at home in the tapis franc and in language familiar to all the guests requested to be supplied with supper he was so placed that he could observe the two ill-looking scoundrels who had asked after gros boiteux and the schoolmaster he did not take his eyes off them but in consequence of their position they could not see that they were the objects of such marked and constant attention the conversation momentarily interrupted was resumed in spite of his natural audacity the chourineur showed a deference for rodolph and abstained from familiarity by jove said he to rodolph although i have smarted for it yet i am very glad to have met with you what because you relish the harlequin why maybe so but more because i am all on the fret to see you serve out the schoolmaster to see him who has always crowed over me crowed over in his turn would do me good do you suppose then that for your amusement i mean to spring at the schoolmaster and pin him like a bulldog no but he'll have at you in a moment when he learns that you are a better man than he replied the chourineur rubbing his hands well i have coin enough left to pay him in full said rodolph in a careless tone but it is horrible weather what say you to a cup of brandy with sugar in it that's the ticket said the chourineur and that we may be better acquainted we will tell each other who we are added rodolph the albinos call the chourineur a freed convict worker at the wood that floats at st paul's quay frozen in the winter scorched in the summer from twelve to fifteen hours a day in the water half man half frog that's my description said rodolph's companion making him a military salute with his left hand well now and you my master this is your first appearance in the cite i don't mean anything to offend but you entered head foremost against my skull and beating the drum on my carcass by all that's ugly what a rattling you made especially with these blows with which you doubled me up i never can forget them thick as buttons what a torrent but you have some trade besides polishing off the chourineur i am a fan painter and my name is rodolphe a fan painter ah that's the reason then that your hands are so white added the chourineur if all your fellow workmen are like you there must be a tidy lot of you but as you are a workman what brings you to a tapis franc in the cite where there are only prigs cracksmen or freed convicts like myself and you only come here because we cannot go elsewhere this is no place for you honest mechanics have their coffee shops and don't talk slang i come here because i like good company gammon said the chourineur shaking his head with an air of doubt i found you in the passage of bras rouge well man never mind you say you don't know him what do you mean with all your nonsense about your bras rouge let him go to the stay master of mine you perhaps distrust me but you are wrong and if you like i will tell you my history but that is on condition that you teach me how to give those precious thumps which settled my business so quickly what say you i agree chourineur tell me your story and goualeuse will also tell hers very well replied the chourineur it is not whether to turn a mangicur out of doors and it will be an amusement do you agree goualeuse oh certainly but my story is a very short one said fleur de marie and you will have to tell us your history comrade rodolph added the chourineur well then i'll begin fan painter said goualeuse what a very pretty trade and how much can you earn if you stick close to work inquired the chourineur i work by the piece responded rodolph my good days are worth three francs sometimes four in summer when the days are long 
and you are idle sometimes you rascal yes as long as i have money though i do not waste it first i pay ten sous for my night's lodging your pardon monseigneur you sleep then at ten sous do you said the chourineur raising his hand to his cap the word monseigneur spoken ironically by the chourineur caused an almost imperceptible smile on the lips of rodolph who replied oh i like to be clean and comfortable here's a peer of the realm for you a man with mines of wealth exclaimed the chourineur he pays ten sous for his bed well then continued rodolph four sous for tobacco that makes fourteen sous four sous for breakfast eighteen fifteen sous for dinner one or two sous for brandy that all comes to about thirty-four or thirty-five sous a day i have no occasion to work all the week and so the rest of the time i amuse myself and your family said the goualeuse dead replied rodolph who were your friends asked the goualeuse dealers in old clothes and marine stores under the pillars of the market-place how did you spend what they left you inquired the chourineur i was very young and my guardian sold the stock and when i came of age he brought me in his debtor for thirty francs that was my inheritance and who is now your employer the chourineur demanded his name is gautier in the rue des bourdonnais a beast brute thief miser he would almost as soon lose the sight of an eye as pay his workmen now this is as true a description as i can give you of him so let's have done with him i learned my trade under him from the time when i was fifteen years of age i have a good number in the conscription and my name is rodolphe durand my history is told now it's your turn goualeuse said the chourineur i keep my history till last as a bonne bouche End of chapter two chapter three of mysteries of paris volume one by eugene Sue. this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three history of la goualeuse let us begin at the beginning said the chourineur yes your parents added rodolph i never knew them said fleur de marie the deuce said the chourineur well that is odd goualeuse you and i are of the same family what you too chourineur an orphan of the streets of paris like you my girl then who brought you up goualeuse asked rodolph i don't know sir as far back as i can remember i was i think about six or seven years old i was with an old one-eyed woman whom they call the chouette because she had a hooked nose a green eye quite round and was like an owl with one eye out note six the chouette the screech owl <laughs> i think i see her the old night-bird shouted the chourineur laughing the one-eyed woman resumed fleur de marie made me sell barley sugar in the evenings on the pont neuf but that was only an excuse for asking charity and when i did not bring her in at least ten sous the chouette beat me instead of giving me any supper are you sure the woman was not your mother inquired rodolph quite sure for she often scolded me for being fatherless and motherless and said she picked me up one day in the street so said the chourineur you had a dance instead of a meal if you did not pick up ten sous yes and after that i went to lie down on some straw spread on the ground when i was cold very cold i do not doubt it for the feather of beans straw is a very cold sort of stuff said the chourineur a dung heap is twice as good but then people don't like your smell and say oh the blackguard where has he been this remark made rodolph smile whilst fleur de marie thus continued next day the one-eyed woman gave me a similar allowance for breakfast as for supper and sent me to montfaucon to get some worms to bait for fish for in the daytime the chouette kept her stall for selling fishing lines near the bridge of notre dame for a child of seven years of age who is half dead with hunger and cold it is a long way from the rue de la mortellerie to montfaucon but exercise has made you grow as straight as an arrow my girl you have no reason to complain of that said the chourineur striking a light for his pipe well said the goualeuse i returned very very tired then at noon 
the chouette gave me a little bit of bread ah eating so little has kept your figure as fine as a needle girl you must not find fault with that said the chourineur puffing out a cloud of tobacco smoke but what ails you comrade i mean master rodolph you seem quite down like are you sorry for the girl and her miseries ah we all have and have had our miseries yes but not such miseries as mine chourineur said fleur de marie what not i goualeuse why my lass you were a queen to me at least when you were little you slept on straw and ate bread i passed my most comfortable nights in the lime kilns at clichy like a regular vagabond i fed on cabbage stumps and other refuse vegetables which i picked up when and where i could but very often as it was so far to the lime kilns at clichy and i was tired after my work i slept under the large stones at the louvre and then in winter i had white sheets that is whenever the snow fell a man is stronger but a poor little girl said fleur de marie and yet with all that i was as plump as a skylark what you remember that eh to be sure i do when the chouette beat me i fell always at the first blow then she stamped upon me screaming out ah the nasty little brute she hasn't a farden's worth of strength she can't stand even two thumps and then she called me pegriotte little thief i never had any other name that was my baptismal name like me i had the baptism of a dog in a ditch and they called me fellow or you sir or albino it is really surprising my wench how much we resemble each other said the chourineur that's true in our misery said fleur de marie who addressed herself to the chourineur almost always feeling in spite of herself a sort of shame at the presence of rodolph hardly venturing to raise her eyes to him although in appearance he belonged to that class with whom she ordinarily lived and when you had fetched the worms for the chouette what did you do inquired the chourineur why she made me beg until night then in the evening she went to sell fried fish on the pont neuf oh dear at that time it was a long while to wait for my morsel of bread and if i dared to ask the chouette for something to eat she beat me and said get ten sous then you shall have your supper then i being very hungry and as she hurt me very much cried with a very full heart and sore body the chouette tied my little basket of barley sugar round my neck and stationed me on the pont neuf where in winter i was frozen to death but sometimes in spite of myself i slept as i stood but not long for the chouette kicked me until i awoke i remained on the bridge till eleven o'clock my stock of the barley sugar hanging round my neck and often crying heartily the passengers touched by my tears sometimes gave me a sou and then i gained ten and sometimes fifteen sous which i gave to the chouette who searched me all over and even looked in my mouth to see if i had kept back anything well fifteen sous was a good haul for a little bird like you it was and then the one-eyed woman seeing that with her one eye said the chourineur laughing of course because she had but one well then she finding that when i cried i got more money always beat me severely before she put me on the bridge brutal but cunning well at last i got hardened to blows and as the chouette got in a passion when i did not cry why i to be revenged upon her the more she thumped me the more i laughed although the tears came into my eyes with the pain but poor goualeuse did not the sticks of barley sugar make you long for them ah yes chourineur but i never tasted them it was my ambition and my ambition ruined me one day returning from montfauçon some little boys beat me and stole my basket i came back well knowing what was in store for me and i had a shower of thumps and no bread in the evening before going to the bridge the chouette savage because i had not brought in anything the evening before instead of beating me as usual to make me cry made me bleed by pulling my hair from the sides of the temples where it is most tender tonnerre that was coming it too strong said the bandit striking his fist heavily on the table and frowning sternly to beat a child is no such great thing but to ill-use one so heaven and earth 
rodolph had listened attentively to the recital of fleur de marie and now looked at the chourineur with astonishment the display of such feeling quite surprised him what ails you chourineur he inquired what ails me ails me why have you no feeling that devil's dam of a chouette who so brutally used this girl are you as hard as your own fists go on my girl said rodolph to fleur de marie without appearing to notice the chourineur's appeal i have told you how the chouette ill-used me to make me cry i was then sent on to the bridge with my barley sugar the one-eyed was at her usual spot and from time to time shook her doubled fist at me however as i had not broken my fast since the night before and as i was very hungry at the risk of putting the chouette in a passion i took a piece of barley sugar and began to eat it well done girl i ate another piece bravo go it my hearties i found it so good not from daintiness but real hunger but then a woman who sold oranges cried out to the one-eyed woman look ye there chouette pigriotte is eating the barley sugar oh thunder and lightning said the chourineur that would enrage her make her in a passion poor little mouse what a fright you were in when the chouette saw you eh how did you get out of that affair poor goualeuse asked rodolph with as much interest as the chourineur why it was a serious matter to me but that was afterwards for the chouette although boiling over with rage at seeing me devour the barley sugar could not leave her stove for the fish was frying ha <laughs> ha true true that was a difficult position for her said the chourineur laughing heartily at a distance the chouette threatened me with her long iron fork but when her fish was cooked she came towards me i had only collected three sous and i had eaten six sous worth she did not say a word but took me by the hand and dragged me away with her at this moment i do not know how it was that i did not die on the spot with fright i remember it as well as if it was this very moment it was very near to new year's day and there were a great many shops on the pont neuf all filled with toys and i had been looking at them all the evening with the greatest delight beautiful dolls little furnished houses you know how very amusing such things are for a child you had never had any playthings had you goualeuse asked the chourineur i mon dieu who was there to give me any playthings said the girl in a sad tone well the evening passed although it was in the depth of winter i only had on a little cotton gown no stockings no shift and with wooden shoes on my feet that was not enough to stifle me with heat was it well when the old woman took my hand i burst out into a perspiration from head to foot what frightened me most was that instead of swearing and storming as usual she only kept on grumbling between her teeth she never let go my hand but made me walk so fast so very fast that i was obliged to run to keep up with her and in running i had lost one of my wooden shoes and as i did not dare to say so i followed her with one foot naked on the bare stones when we reached home it was covered with blood a hey, one-eyed old devil's kin said the chourineur again thumping the table in his anger it makes my heart quite cold to think of the poor little thing trotting alongside that cursed old brute with her poor little foot all bloody we lived in a garret in the rue de la montellerie beside the entrance to our alley there was a dram shop and there the chouette went in still dragging me by the hand she then had a half pint of brandy at the bar the deuce why i could not drink that without being quite fuddled it was her usual quantity perhaps that was the reason why she beat me of an evening well at last we got up into our cock loft the chouette double locked the door i threw myself on my knees and asked her pardon for having eaten the barley sugar she did not answer me but i heard her mumbling to herself as she walked about the room what shall i do this evening to this little thief who has eaten all that barley sugar ah i see and she looked at me maliciously with her one green eye i was still on my knees when she suddenly went to a shelf and took down a pair of pincers pincers exclaimed the chourineur yes pincers what for 
to strike you inquired rodolph to pinch you said the chourineur no no answered the poor girl trembling at the very recollection to pull out your hair no to take out one of my teeth the chourineur uttered a blasphemous oath accompanied with such furious imprecations that all the guests in the tapis franc looked at him with astonishment why what is the matter with you asked rodolph the matter the matter i'll skin her alive that infernal old hag if i can catch her where is she tell me where is she let me find her and i'll throttle the old and did she really take out your tooth my poor child that wretched monster in woman's shape demanded rodolph whilst the chourineur was venting his rage in a volley of the most violent reproaches yes sir but not at the first pull how i suffered she held me with my head between her knees where she held it as if in a vice then half with her pincers half with her fingers she pulled out my tooth and then said now i will pull out one every day pigriotte and when you have not a tooth left i will throw you into the river and the fish shall eat you the old devil to break and pull out a poor child's teeth in that way exclaimed the chourineur with redoubled fury and how did you escape her then inquired rodolph of the goualeuse next day instead of going to montfauçon i went on the side of the champs elysees so frightened was i of being drowned by the chouette i would have run to the end of the world rather than be again in the chouette's hands after walking and walking i fairly lost myself i had not begged a farthing and the more i thought the more frightened did i become at night i hid myself in a timber-yard under some piles of wood as i was very little i was able to creep under an old door and hide myself amongst a heap of logs i was so hungry that i tried to gnaw a piece of the bark but i could not bite it it was too hard at length i fell asleep in the morning hearing a noise i hid myself still further back in the wood-pile it was tolerably warm and if i had had something to eat i could not have been better off for the winter like me in the lime-kiln i did not dare to quit the timber-yard for i fancied that the chouette would seek for me everywhere to pull out my teeth and drown me and that she would be sure to catch me if i stirred from where i was stay do not mention that old beast's name again it makes the blood come into my eyes the fact is that you have known misery bitter bitter misery poor little mite how sorry i am that i threatened to beat you just now and frightened you as i am a man i did not mean to do it why would you not have beaten me i have no one to defend me that's the very reason because you are not like the others because you have no one to take your part that i would not have beaten you when i say no one i do not mean our comrade rodolph but his coming was a chance and he certainly did give me my full allowance when we met go on my child said rodolph how did you get away from the timber-yard next day about noon i heard a great dog barking under the woodpile i listened and the bark came nearer and nearer then a deep voice exclaimed my dog barks somebody is hid in the yard they are thieves said another voice and the men then began to encourage the dog and cry find em find em lad the dog ran to me and for fear of being bitten i began to cry out with all my might and main hark said one of them i hear the cry of a child they called back the dog i came out from the pile of wood and saw a gentleman and a man in a blouse ah you little thief what are you doing in my timber-yard said the gentleman in a cross tone i put my hands together and said don't hurt me pray i have had nothing to eat for two days and i've run away from the chouette who pulled out my tooth and said she would throw me over to the fishes not knowing where to sleep i was passing before your door and i slept for the night amongst these logs under this heap not thinking i hurt anybody i'm not to be gammoned by you you little hussy you came to steal my logs go and call the watch said the timber merchant to his man ah the old vagabond the old reprobate call the watch why didn't he send for the artillery said the chourineur steal his logs and you only eight years old 
what an old ass not true sir his man replied steal your logs master how can she do that she is not so big as the smallest piece you are right replied the timber merchant but if she does not come for herself she does for others thieves have a parcel of children whom they send to pry about and hide themselves to open the doors of houses she must be taken to the commissary and mind she does not escape upon my life this timber merchant was more of a log than any log in his own yard said the chourineur i was taken to the commissary resumed goualeuse i accused myself of being a wanderer and they sent me to prison i was sent before the tribunal and sentence as a rogue and vagabond to remain until i was sixteen years of age in a house of correction i thank the judges much for their kindness for in prison i had food i was not beaten and it was a paradise after the cock loft of the chouette then in prison i learned to sew but sad to say i was idle i preferred singing to work and particularly when i saw the sunshine ah when the sun shone on the walls of the prison i could not help singing and then when i could sing i seemed no longer to be a prisoner it was after i began to sing so much that they called me goualeuse instead of pigriotte well when i was sixteen i left the jail at the door i found the ogress here and two or three old women who had come to see my fellow-prisoners and who had always told me that when i left the prison they would find work for me yes yes i see said the chourineur my pretty little maid said the ogress and her old companions come and lodge with us we will give you good clothes and then you may amuse yourself i didn't like them and refused saying to myself i know how to sew very well and i have two hundred francs in hand i have been eight years in prison i should like to enjoy myself a bit that won't hurt anybody work will come when the money is spent and so i began to spend my two hundred francs ah that was my mistake added fleur de marie with a sigh i ought first to have got my work but i hadn't a soul on earth to advise me at sixteen to be thrown on the city of paris as i was one is so lonely and what is done is done i have done wrong and i have suffered for it i began to spend my money first i bought flowers to put in my room i do love flowers then i bought a gown a nice shawl and i took a walk in the bois de boulogne and i went to st germain vincennes and other country places oh how i love the country with a lover by your side my girl asked the chourineur oh mon dieu no i like to be my own mistress i had my little excursions with a friend who was in prison with me a good little girl as can be they call her rigolette because she is always laughing rigolette rigolette i don't know her said the chourineur who appeared to be appealing to his memory i didn't think you knew her i am sure rigolette was very well behaved in prison and always so gay and so industrious she took out with her when she left the prison at least four hundred francs that she had earned and then she is so particular you should see her when i say i had no one to advise me i am wrong i ought to have listened to her for after having had a week's amusement together she said to me now we have had such a holiday we ought to try for work and not spend our money in waste i who was so happy in the fields and the woods it was just at the end of spring this year i answered oh i must be idle a little longer and then i will work hard since that time i have not seen rigolette but i heard a few days since that she was living near the temple that she was a famous needlewoman and earned at least twenty-five sous a day and has a small workroom of her own but now i could not for the world see her again i should die with shame if i met her so then my poor girl said rodolph you spent your money in the country you like the country do you like it i love it oh what i would not give to live there rigolette on the contrary prefers paris and likes to walk on the boulevards but she is so nice and so kind she went into the country only to please me and you do not even leave yourself a few sous to live upon whilst you found work said the chourineur yes i had reserved about fifty francs but it happened that i had for my washerwoman a woman called lorraine a poor thing with none but the good god to protect her 
she was then very near her confinement and yet was obliged all day long to be with her hands and feet in her washing tubs she fell sick and not being able to work applied for admittance to a lying-in hospital but there was no room she could not work and her time was very near at hand and she had not a sou to pay for the bed in a garret from which they drove her fortunately she met one day at the end of the pont notre dame with goubin's wife who had been hiding for four days in a cellar of a house which was being pulled down behind the hotel dieu but why was goubin's wife hiding to escape from her husband who threatened to kill her and she only went out at night to buy some bread and it was then she met with poor lorraine ill and hardly able to drag herself along for she was expecting to be brought to bed every hour well it seems this goubin's wife took her to the cellar where she was hiding it was just a shelter and no more there she shared her bread and straw with the poor lorraine who was confined in this cellar of a poor little infant her only covering in bed was straw well it seems that goubin's wife could not bear it and so going out at all risks even of being killed by her husband who was looking for her everywhere she left the cellar in open day and came to me she knew i had still a little money left and that i could assist her if i would so when helmina had told me all about poor lorraine who was obliged to lie with her new-born babe on straw i told her to bring them both to my room at once and i would take a chamber for her next to mine this i did and oh how happy she was poor lorraine when she found herself in a bed with her babe beside her in a little couch which i had bought for her helmina and i nursed her until she was able to get about again and then with the rest of my money i enabled her to return to her washing tubs and when all your money was spent on lorraine and her infant what did you do my child inquired rodolph i looked out for work but it was too late i can sew very well i have good courage and thought that i had only to ask for work and get it ah how i deceived myself i went into a shop where they sell ready-made linen and asked for employment and as i would not tell a story i said i had just left prison they showed me the door without making me any answer i begged they would give me a trial and they pushed me into the street as if i had been a thief then i remembered too late what rigolette had told me little by little i sold my small stock of clothes and linen and when all was gone and they turned me out of my lodging i had not tasted food for two days i did not know where to sleep at this moment i met the ogress and one of her old women who knew where i lodged and was always coming about me since i left prison they told me they would find me work and i believed them i went with them so exhausted for want of food that my senses were gone they gave me brandy to drink and and here i am said the unhappy creature hiding her face in her hands have you lived a long time with the ogress my poor girl asked rodolph in accents of the deepest compassion six weeks sir replied goualeuse shuddering as she spoke i see i see said the chourineur i know you now as well as if i were your father and mother and you had never left my lap well well this is a confession indeed it makes you sad my girl to tell the story of your life said rodolph alas sir replied fleur de marie sorrowfully since i was born this is the first time it ever happened to me to recall all these things at once and my tale is not a merry one well said the chourineur ironically you are sorry perhaps that you are not a kitchen wench in a cook-shop or a servant to some old brutes who think of no one but themselves ah said fleur de marie with a deep sigh to be quite happy we must be quite virtuous oh what is your little head about now exclaimed the chourineur with a loud burst of laughter why not count your rosary in honour of your father and mother whom you never knew my father and mother abandoned me in the street like a puppy that is one too many in the house perhaps they had not enough to feed themselves said goualeuse with bitterness i want nothing of them i complain of nothing but there are lots happier than mine yours why what would you have you are as handsome as a venus and yet only sixteen and a half you sing like a nightingale behave yourself very prettily are called fleur de marie and yet you complain what will you say i should like to know when you will have a stove under your paddlers and a chinchilla boa like the ogress oh i shall never be so old as she is 
perhaps you have a charm for never growing any older no but i could not lead such a life i have already a bad cough ah i see you already in the cold meat-box go along you silly child you do you often have such thoughts as these goualeuse said rodolph sometimes you perhaps monsieur rodolph understand me in the morning when i go to buy my milk from the milkwoman at the corner of rue de la vieille de la Prie, with the sou which the ogress gives me and see her go away in her little cart drawn by her donkey i do envy her so and i say to myself she is going into the country to the pure air to her home and her family and then i return alone into the garret of the ogress where you cannot see plainly even at noonday well child be good laugh at your troubles be good said the chourineur good mon dieu and how do you mean be good the clothes i wear belong to the ogress and i am in debt to her for my board and lodging i can't stir from her she would have me taken up as a thief i belong to her and i must pay her when she had uttered these last words the unhappy girl could not help shuddering and a tear trembled in her long eyelashes well but remain as you are and do not compare yourself to a country milkwoman said the chourineur are you taking leave of your senses only think you may yet cut a figure in the capital whilst the milkwoman must boil the pot for her brats milk her cows gather grass for her rabbits and perhaps after all get a black eye from her husband when he comes home from the pot-house why it is really ridiculous to hear you talk of envying her the goualeuse did not reply her eye was fixed her heart was full and the expression of her face was painfully distressed rodolph had listened to the recital made with so painful a frankness with deep interest misery destitution ignorance of the world had weighed down this wretched girl cast at sixteen years of age on the wide world of paris rodolph involuntarily thought of a beloved child whom he had lost a girl dead at six years of age and who had she survived would have been like fleur de marie sixteen years and a half old this recollection excited the more highly his solicitude for the unhappy creature whose narration he had just heard End of chapter three chapter four of mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the chourineur's history the reader has not forgotten the two guests at the tapis franc who were watched so closely by the third individual who had come into the cabaret we have said that one of these fellows who had on a greek cap and concealed his left hand with much care asked the ogress if the schoolmaster and gros Boiteux had not arrived during the story of the goualeuse which they could not overhear they had been constantly talking in a very low tone throwing occasional hurried glances at the door he who wore the greek cap said to his comrade the gros boiteux does not show nor the schoolmaster perhaps the skeleton has done for him and made off with the swag a precious go that would be for us who laid the plant and look out for our snacks replied the other the newcomer who observed the two men was seated too far off to hear a word they said but after having cautiously consulted a small paper concealed at the bottom of his cap he appeared satisfied with his remarks rose from the table and said to the ogress who was sleeping at the bar with her feet on the stove and her great cat on her knee i say mother ponice i shall soon be back again take care of my pitcher and my plate i don't want any one to make free with them make yourself easy my fine fellow said mother ponice if your plate and pitcher are empty no one will touch them the newcomer laughed loudly at the joke of the ogress and then slipped out so that his departure was unnoticed at that moment when this man retired and before the door could be shut rodolph saw the charcoal dealer whose black face and tall form we have already alluded to and he had just time to manifest to him by an impatient gesture how much he disliked his watchful attendance but the charcoal man did not appear to heed this in the least and still kept hanging about the tapis franc the countenance of the goualeuse became still more saddened with her back to the wall her head drooping on her bosom her full blue eyes gazing mechanically about her the unfortunate being seemed bowed down by the weight of her oppressive thoughts 
two or three times having met rodolph's fixed look she turned away unable to account to herself for the singular impression which the unknown had caused her weighed down and abashed at his presence she almost regretted having made so candid a narrative to him of her unhappy life the chourineur on the contrary was quite high in spirits he had devoured the whole harlequin without the least assistance the wine and brandy had made him very communicative the fact of his having found his master as he called him had been forgotten in the generous conduct of rodolph and he also detected so decided a physical superiority that his humiliation had given way to a sentiment of admiration mingled with fear and respect this absence of rancour and the savage pride with which he boasted of never having robbed proved that the chourineur was not as yet thoroughly hardened this had not escaped the sagacity of rodolph and he awaited the man's recital with curiosity now my boy said he we are listening the chourineur emptied his glass and thus began you my poor girl were at last taken to by the chouette whom the devil confound you never had a shelter until the moment when you were imprisoned as a vagabond i can never recollect having slept in what is called a bed before i was nineteen years of age a happy age and then i became a trooper what you have served then chourineur said rodolph three years but you will hear all about it the stones of the louvre the lime kilns of clichy and the quarries of montrouge these were the hotels of my youth then i had my house in paris and in the country who but i and what was your trade faith master i have a foggy recollection of having strolled about in my childhood with an old rag-picker who almost thumped me to death and it must be true for i have never since met one of these old cupids with a wicker-work quiver without a longing to pitch into him a proof that one of them must have thumped me when i was a child my first employment was to help the knackers to cut the horses throats at montfauçon i was about ten or twelve when i began to slash chouriner these poor old beasts it had quite an impression on me at the month's end i thought no more about it on the contrary i began to like my trade no one had his knife so sharpened and keen-edged as mine and that made me rejoice in using it when i had cut the animals throats they gave me for my trouble a piece of the thigh of some animal that had died of disease for those that they slaughter are sold to the cagmag shops near the school of medicine who convert it into beef mutton veal or game according to the taste of the purchasers however when i got to my morsel of horse's flesh i was as happy as a king i went with it into the lime kiln like a wolf to his lair and then with the leave of the lime burners i made a glorious fry on the ashes when the burners were not at work i picked up some dry wood at romainville set light to it and broiled my steak under the walls of the bone-house the meat certainly was bloody and almost raw but that made a change and your name what did they call you asked rodolph i had hair much more flaxen than now and the blood was always in my eyes and so they called me the albino the albinos are the white rabbits amongst men they have red eyes added the chourineur in a grave tone and as it were with a physiological parenthesis and your relations your family my relations oh they lodge at the same number as the goualeuse place of my birth why the first corner of no matter what street either on the right or left hand side of the way and either going up or coming down the kennel then you have cursed your father and mother for having abandoned you why that would not have set my leg if i had broken it no matter though it's true they played me a scurvy trick in bringing me into the world but i should not have complained if they had made me as beggars ought to be made that is to say without the sense of cold hunger or thirst beggars who don't like thieving would find it greatly to their advantage you were cold thirsty hungry chourineur and yet you did not steal no and yet i was horribly wretched it's a fact that i have often gone with an empty bread basket fasted for two days at a time that was more than my share but i never stole for fear of jail pooh said the chourineur shrugging his shoulders and laughing loudly i should then not have stolen bread for fear of getting my allowance eh 
an honest man i was famishing a thief i should have been supported in prison and right well too but i did not steal because because why because the idea of stealing never came across me so that's all about it this reply noble as it was in itself but of the rectitude of which the chourineur himself had no idea perfectly astonished rodolph he felt that the poor fellow who had remained honest in the midst of the most cruel privations was to be respected twofold since the punishment of the crime became a certain resource for him rodolph held out his hand to this ill-used savage of civilization whom misery had been unable wholly to corrupt the chourineur looked at his host in astonishment almost with respect he hardly dared to touch the hand tendered to him he felt impressed with some vague idea that there was a wide abyss between rodolph and himself tis well said rodolph to him you have heart and honour heart honour what i come now don't chaff me he replied with surprise to suffer misery and hunger rather than steal is to have heart and honour said rodolph gravely well it may be said the chourineur as if thinking it may be so does it astonish you it really does for people don't usually say such things to me they generally treat me as though they would a mangy dog it's odd though the effect what you say has on me heart honour he repeated with an air which was actually pensive well what ails you i faith i don't know replied the chourineur in a tone of emotion but these words do you see they quite make my heart beat and i feel more flattered than if any one told me i was a better man than either the skeleton or the schoolmaster i never felt anything like it before be sure though that these words and the blows of the fist at the end of my tussle you did lay em on like a good un not alluding to what you pay for the supper and the words you have said in a word he exclaimed bluntly as if he could not find language to express his thoughts make sure that in life or death you may depend on the chourineur rodolph unwilling to betray his emotion replied in a tone as calm as he could assume how long did you go on as an amateur knacker why at first i was quite sick of cutting up old worn-out horses who could not even kick but when i was about sixteen and my voice began to get rough it became a passion a taste a relish a rage with me to cut and slash i did not care for anything but that not even eating and drinking you should have seen me in the middle of my work except an old pair of woollen trousers i was quite naked when with my large and well wetted knife in my hand i had about me fifteen or twenty horses waiting their turn by jupiter when i began to slaughter them i don't know what possessed me i was like a fury my ears had singing in them and i saw everything red all was red and i slashed and slashed and slashed until my knife fell from my hands thunder what happiness had i had millions i could have paid them to have enjoyed my trade it is that which has given you the habit of stabbing said rodolph very likely but when i was turned of sixteen the passion became so strong that when i once began slashing i became mad i spoiled my work yes i spoiled the skins because i slashed and cut them across and across for i was so furious that i could not see clearly at last they turned me out of the yard i wanted employment with the butchers for i have always liked that sort of business well they quite looked down upon me they despised me as a shoemaker does a cobbler then i had to seek my bread elsewhere and i didn't find it very readily and this was the time when my bread basket was so often empty at length i got employment in the quarries at mont rouge but at the end of two years i was tired of going always around like a squirrel in his cage and drawing stone for twenty sous a day i was tall and strong and so i enlisted in a regiment they asked my name my age and my papers my name the albino my age look at my beard my papers here's the certificate of the master quarryman as i was just the fellow for a grenadier they took me 
with your strength courage and taste for chopping and slashing you ought in war time to have been made an officer thunder and lightning what do you say what to cut up english or prussians why that would have been better than to cut up old horses but worse luck there was no war but a great deal of discipline an apprentice tries to hit his master a thump well if he be the weaker why he gets the worst of it if he be the stronger he has the best of it he is turned out of doors perhaps put into the cage and that is all in the army it is quite a different thing one day our sergeant had bullied me a good deal to make me more attentive he was right for i was very slow i did not like a poke he gave me and i kicked at him he pushed me again i returned his poke he collared me and i gave him a punch of the head they fell on me and then my blood was up in my eyes and i was enraged in a moment i had my knife in my hand i belonged to the cookery and i went at my hardest i cut slashed slashed chopped as if i was in the slaughter-house i made cold meat of the sergeant wounded two soldiers it was a real shambles i gave the three eleven wounds yes eleven blood flowed flowed everywhere blood as though we were in the bone-house i swam in it the brigand lowered his head with a sombre sullen air and was silent what are you thinking of chourineur asked rodolph with interest nothing he replied abruptly and then with an air of brutish carelessness he added at length they handcuffed me and brought me before the big wigs and i was cast for death you escaped however true but i had fifteen years of the galleys instead of being scragged i forgot to tell you that whilst in the regiment i had saved two of my comrades from drowning in the marne when we were quartered at milan at another time you will laugh and say i am amphibious either in fire or water when saving men or women at another time being in garrison at rouen all the wooden houses in one quarter were on fire and burning like so many matches i am the lad for a fire and so i went to the place in an instant they told me that there was an old woman who was bedridden and could not escape from her room which was already in flames i went towards it and by jove how it did burn it reminded me of the lime-kilns in my happy days however i saved the old woman although i had the very soles of my feet scorched thanks to my having done these things and the cunning of my advocate my sentence was changed and instead of being scragged i was only sent to the hulks for fifteen years when i found that my life would be spared and i was to go to the galleys i would have jumped upon the babbling fool and twisted his neck at the moment when he came to wish me joy and to tell me he had saved my life and be hanged to him only they prevented me were you sorry then to have your sentence commuted yes for those who sport with the knife the headman's steel is the proper fate for those who steal the darbies to their heels each is proper punishment but to force you to live amongst galley slaves when you have a right to be guillotined out of hand is infamous and besides my life when i first went to the bang was rather queer one don't kill a man and soon forget it you must know you feel some remorse then chourineur remorse no for i have served my time said the savage but at first a night did not pass but i saw like a nightmare the sergeant and soldiers whom i had slashed and slaughtered that is they were not alone added the brigand in a voice of terror these were in tens and dozens and hundreds and thousands each waiting his turn in a kind of slaughter-house like the horses whose throats i used to cut at montfauçon awaiting each his turn then then i saw red and began to cut and slash away on these men as i used formerly to do on the horses the more however i chopped down the soldiers the faster the ranks filled up with others and as they died they looked at one with an air so gentle so gentle that i cursed myself for killing em but i couldn't help it that was not all i never had a brother and yet it seemed as if every one of those whom i killed was my brother and i loved all of them at last when i could bear it no longer i used to wake covered all over with sweat as cold as melting snow 
that was a horrid dream chourineur it was yes that dream do you see was enough to drive one mad or foolish so twice i tried to kill myself once by swallowing verdigris and another time by trying to choke myself with my chain but confound it i am as strong as a bull the verdigris only made me thirsty and as for the twist of the chain round my neck why that only gave me a natural cravat of a blue colour afterwards the desire of life came back to me nay nightmare ceased to torment me and i did as others did at the bang you were in a good school for learning how to thieve yes but it was not to my taste the other prigs bullied me but i soon silenced them with a few thumps of my chain it was in this way i first knew the schoolmaster and i must pay him the compliment due to his blows he paid me off as you did some little time ago he is then a criminal who has served his time he was sentenced for life but escaped escaped and not denounced i'm not the man to denounce him besides it would seem as if i were afraid of him but how is it that the police do not detect him have they not got his description his description oh yes yes but it is long since he has scraped out from his viz what nature had placed there now none but the baker who puts the condemned in his oven the devil could recognize him the schoolmaster what has he done to himself he began by destroying his nose which was an ell long he ate it off with vitriol you jest if he comes in this evening you'll see he had a nose like a parrot and now it is as flat as in a death's head to say nothing of his lips which are as thick as your fist and his face which is as wrinkled as the waistcoat of a rag picker and so he is not recognized it is six months since he escaped from rochefort and the traps have met him a hundred times without knowing him why was he at the bang for having been a forger thief and assassin he is called the schoolmaster because he wrote a splendid hand and has had a good education and he is much feared it will not be any longer when you have given him such a licking as you gave me oh by jove i am anxious to see it what does he do for a living he is associated with an old woman as bad as himself and as deep as the old one but she is never seen though he has told the ogress that some day or other he would bring his mo woman with him and this woman helps him in his robberies yes and in his murders too they say he brags of having already with her assistance done for two or three persons and amongst others three weeks ago a cattle dealer on the road to poissy whom they also robbed he will be taken sooner or later they must be very cunning as well as powerful to do that for he has always under his blouse a brace of loaded pistols and a dagger he says that charlot the executioner waits for him and he can only lose his head once and so he will kill all he can kill to try and escape and as he is twice as strong as you and i they will have a tough job who take him what did you do chourineur when you left the bagne i offered myself to the master lighterman of the quai st paul and i get my livelihood there but as you have never been a prig why do you live in the cité why where else can i live who likes to be seen with a discharged criminal i should be tired of always being alone for i like company and here i am with my equals i have a bit of a row sometimes and they fear me like fire in the cité but the police have nothing to say to me except now and then for a shindy for which they give me perhaps twenty-four hours at the watch-house and there's an end of that what do you earn a day thirty-five sous for taking in the river foot-baths up to the stomach from twelve to fifteen hours a day summer and winter but let me be just and tell the truth so if through having my toes in the water i get the grenouille note seven a disease of the skin to which all who work in the water are liable i am allowed to break my arms in breaking up old vessels and unloading timber on my back i begin as a beast of burden and end like a fish's tail when i lose my strength entirely i shall take a rake and a wicker basket like the old rag-picker whom i see in the recollections of my childhood and yet you are not unhappy there are worse than i am 
and without my dreams of the sergeant and soldiers with their throats cut for i have the dream still sometimes i could quietly wait for the moment when i should drop down dead at the corner of some dunghill like that at which i was born but the dream the dream by heaven and earth i don't like even to think of that said the chourineur and he emptied his pipe at the corner of the table the goualeuse had hardly listened to the chourineur she seemed wholly absorbed in a deep and melancholy reverie rodolph himself was pensive a tragic incident occurred which brought these three personages to a recollection of the spot in which they were End of chapter four chapter five of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter v the arrest the man who had gone out for a moment after having requested the ogress to look after his jug and plate soon returned accompanied by a tall brawny man to whom he said it was a chance to meet in this way old fellow come in and let us have a glass together the chourineur said in a low voice to rodolph and the goualeuse pointing to the newcomer we shall have a row he's a trap look out for squalls the two ruffians one of whom with the greek skull-cap pulled over his brows had inquired several times for the schoolmaster and the gros boiteux exchanged rapid glances of the eye and rising suddenly from the table went towards the door but the two police officers uttering a peculiar note seized them a fierce struggle ensued the door of the tavern opened and all of the policemen dashed into the room whilst outside were seen the muskets of the gendarmes taking advantage of the tumult the charcoal seller of whom we have spoken advanced to the threshold of the tapis franc and meeting the eye of rodolph he put to his lips the forefinger of his right hand rodolph with a gesture as rapid as it was imperious desired him to go and then turned his attention to the scene before him the man with the greek skull-cap shrieked with rage and half extended on a table struggled so desperately that three men could scarcely hold him his companion enfeebled dejected with livid aspect and pale lips his lower jaw fallen and shaking convulsively made no resistance but held out his hands to be enclasped by the handcuffs the ogress seated at her bar and used to such scenes remained motionless with her hands in the pockets of her apron what have these fellows done my dear monsieur narcisse borel inquired she of one of the policemen whom she knew killed an old woman yesterday in the rue saint christophe and robbed her chamber before she died the poor old thing said she had bitten one of her murderers in the hand we had our eyes on these two scoundrels and my comrade having come to make sure of his men why we have made free to take them how lucky they paid me beforehand for their pint said the ogress won't you take a dram or nothing short monsieur narcisse just a go of retifi of the column thanks mother police but i must make sure of my game one fellow shows fight still the assassin in the greek cap was furious with rage and when they tried to get him into a hackney coach which was waiting in the street he resisted so stoutly that they were obliged to carry him his accomplice seized with a nervous tremor could hardly support himself and his blue lips trembled as though he were speaking they threw him helpless and unresisting into the vehicle before he left the tapis franc the head officer looked attentively at the other guests assembled and said to the chourineur in a tone almost kind what you here you bad lot why it is a long time since we heard anything of you what no more rows are you growing steady steady as a stone figure why you know that now i never break a head even if i am begged to do so oh i don't think that would cost you much trouble strong as you are yet here is my master said the chourineur laying his hand on rodolph's shoulder stay i do not know him said the agent de police looking steadfastly at rodolph and i do not think we shall form an acquaintance now replied he i hope not for your sake my fine fellow said the agent then turning to the ogress good night mother police your tapis franc is a regular mouse-trap this is the third assassin i have taken here i hope it won't be the last monsieur narcisse it is quite at your service said the ogress making a very insinuating nod with her head after the departure of the police 
the young vagabond with the haggard visage who was smoking and drinking brandy refilled his pipe and said in a hoarse voice to the chourineur didn't you twig the cove in the greek cap he's boulotte's man when i saw the traps walk in i says to myself says i there's something up and then too i saw him keep his hand always under the table it's lucky for the schoolmaster and gros boiteux that they were not here said the ogress greek cap asked twice for him and said they had business together but i never turn nose informer on any customer if they take them very well every one to his trade but i never sell my friends oh talk of the old gentleman and you see his horns added the hag as at the moment a man and woman entered the cabaret here they are the schoolmaster and his companion well he was right not to show her for i never see such an ugly creature in my born days she ought to be very much obliged to him for having taken up with such a face at the name of the schoolmaster a sort of shudder seemed to circulate among the guests of the tapis franc rodolph himself in spite of his natural intrepidity could not wholly subdue a slight emotion at the sight of this redoubtable ruffian whom he contemplated for some seconds with a mixed feeling of curiosity and horror the chourineur had spoken truth when he said that the schoolmaster was frightfully mutilated nothing can be imagined more horrible than the countenance of this man his face was furrowed in all directions with deep livid cicatrices the corrosive action of the vitriol had puffed out his lips the cartilages of his nose were divided and two misshapen holes supplied the loss of nostrils his grey eyes were bright small circular and sparkled savagely his forehead as flat as a tiger's was half hidden beneath a fur cap with long yellow hair looking like the crest of a monster the schoolmaster was not more than five feet four or five his head which was disproportionately large was buried between two shoulders broad powerful and fleshy displaying themselves even under the loose folds of his coarse cotton blouse he had long muscular arms hands short thick and hairy to the very finger's end with legs somewhat bowed whose enormous calves betokened his vast strength this man presented in fact the exaggeration of what there is of short thick-set and condensed in the type of the hercules farnese as to the expression of ferocity which suffused this hideous mask and the restless wild and glaring look more like a wild beast than a human being it is impossible to describe them the woman who accompanied the schoolmaster was old and rather neatly dressed in a brown gown with a plaid shawl of red and black check and a white bonnet rodolph saw her profile and her green eye hooked nose skinny lips peaked chin and countenance at once wicked and cunning reminded him involuntarily of la chouette that horrible old wretch who had made poor fleur de marie her victim he was just on the point of saying this to the girl when he saw her suddenly turn pale with fright whilst looking at the hideous companion of the schoolmaster and seizing the arm of rodolph with a trembling hand the goualeuse said in a low voice oh the chouette the chouette the one-eyed woman at this moment the schoolmaster after having exchanged a few words in an undertone with barbillon came slowly towards the table where rodolph the goualeuse and the chourineur were sitting and addressing himself to fleur-de-marie in a hoarse voice said ah my pretty fair miss you must quit these two muffs and come with me the goualeuse made no reply but clung to rodolph her teeth chattering with fright and i shall not be jealous of my man my little fourline a pet word for assassin added the chouette laughing loudly she had not yet recognized in goualeuse pegriotte her old victim well my little white face dost hear me said the monster advancing if thou dost not come i'll poke your eye out and make you a match for the chouette and thou with the moustache he said to rodolph if thou dost not stand from between me and the wench i'll crack thy crown defend me oh defend me cried fleur-de-marie to rodolph clasping her hands then reflecting that she was about to expose him to great danger she added in a low voice no no do not move mr rodolph if he comes nearer i will cry out for help and for fear of the disturbance which may call in the police the ogress will take my part don't be alarmed my child 
said rodolph looking calmly at the schoolmaster you are beside me don't stir and as this ill-looking scoundrel makes you as well as myself feel uncomfortable i will kick him out thou said the schoolmaster i said rodolph and in spite of the efforts of the goualeuse he rose from the table despite his hardihood the schoolmaster retreated a step so threatening were the looks so commanding the deportment of rodolph there are peculiar glances of the eye which are irresistible and certain celebrated duellists are said to owe their bloody triumphs to this fascinating glance which unmans paralyzes and destroys their adversaries the schoolmaster trembled retreated a step and for once distrustful of his giant strength felt under his blouse for his long cut-and-thrust knife a murder would have stained the tapis franc no doubt if the chouette taking the schoolmaster by the arm had not screamed out a minute a minute fourline let me say a word you shall walk into these two muffs all the same presently the schoolmaster looked at her with astonishment for some minutes she had been looking at fleur de marie with fixed and increasing attention as if trying to refresh her memory at length no doubt remained and she recognized the goualeuse is it possible she cried clasping her hands in astonishment it is pegriotte who stole my barley sugar but where do you come from is it the devil who sends you back and she shook her clenched hand at the young girl you won't come into my clutch again eh but be easy if i do not pull out your teeth i will have out of your eyes every tear in your body come no airs and graces you don't know what i mean why i have found out the people who had the care of you before you were handed over to me the schoolmaster saw at the pre the galleys the man who brought you to my crib when you were a brat and he has proofs that the people who had you first were gentry coves rich people my parents do you know them cried fleur de marie never mind whether i know them or not you shall know nothing about it the secret is mine and my full ins, and i will tear out his tongue rather than he shall blab it what it makes you snivel does it pigriotte oh no said goualeuse with a bitterness of accent now i do not care ever to know my parents whilst la chouette was speaking the schoolmaster had resumed his assurance for looking at rodolph he could not believe that a young man of slight and graceful make could for a moment cope with him and confident in his brutal force he approached the defender of goualeuse and said to the chouette in an imperious voice hold your jaw i will tackle with this swell and then the fair lady may think me more to her fancy than he is with one bound rodolph leaped on the table take care of my plates shouted the ogress the schoolmaster stood on his guard his two hands in front his chest advanced firmly planted on his legs and arched as it were on his brawny legs which were like balusters of stone at the moment when rodolph was springing at him the door of the tapis franc opened with violence and the charcoal man of whom we have spoken before and who was upwards of six feet high dashed into the apartment pushed the schoolmaster on one side rudely and coming up to rodolph said in german in his ear monseigneur the countess and her brother they are at the end of the street at these words rodolph made an impatient and angry gesture threw a louis d'or on the bar of the ogress and made for the door in haste the schoolmaster attempted to arrest rodolph's progress but he turning to him gave him two or three rapid blows with his fist over the nose and eyes and with such potent effect that the beast staggered with very giddiness and fell heavily against a table which alone prevented his prostration on the floor vive la charte those are my blows i know them cried the chourineur two or three more lessons like that and i shall know all about it restored to himself after a few moments the schoolmaster darted off in pursuit of rodolph but he had disappeared with the charcoal man in the dark labyrinth of the streets of the cite and the brigand found it useless to follow at the moment when the schoolmaster had returned foaming with rage two persons approaching down the opposite side to that by which rodolph had disappeared entered into the tapis franc hastily and out of breath as if they had been running far and fast their first impulse was to look around the room how unfortunate said one of them he has gone another opportunity lost 
the two newcomers spoke in english the goualeuse horror-struck at meeting with the chouette and dreading the threats of the schoolmaster took advantage of the tumult and confusion caused by the arrival of the two fresh guests in the tapis franc and quietly gliding out by the half-open door left the cabaret End of chapter five chapter six of the mysteries of paris volume one by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six thomas satan and the countess sarah the two persons who had just entered the tapis franc were quite of another class from those who ordinarily frequented it one tall and erect had hair almost white black eyebrows and whiskers a long and tanned face with a stiff formal air his long frock coat was buttoned up to the throat a la militaire we shall call this individual thomas satan his companion was young pale and handsome and appeared about thirty-one or two years of age his hair eyebrows and eyes were of a deep black which showed off the more fully the pure whiteness of his face by his step the smallness of his stature and the delicacy of his features it was easy to detect a woman in male habiliments this female was the countess sarah macgregor we will hereafter inform our readers of the motives and events which had brought the countess and her brother into this cabaret of the cite call for something to drink thomas and ask the people here about him perhaps they may give us some information said sarah still speaking english the man with white hair and black eyebrows sat down at a table whilst sarah was wiping her forehead and said to the ogress in excellent french madame let us have something to drink if you please the entrance of these two persons into the tapis franc had excited universal attention their dress their manners all announced that they never frequented low drinking shops whilst by their restless looks and disturbed countenances it might be judged that some very powerful motives had led them hither the chourineur the schoolmaster and the chouette viewed them with increasing curiosity startled by the appearance of such strange customers the ogress shared in the general surprise thomas satan a second time and with an impatient tone said we have called for something to drink ma'am pray let us have it mother ponice flattered by their courtesy of manner left her bar and coming towards her new guests leaned her arms on their table and said will you have a pint of wine in measure or a bottle a bottle of wine glasses and some water the ogress brought the supplies demanded and thomas satan threw her a five-franc piece and refused the change which she offered to him keep it my good woman for yourself and perhaps you will take a glass with us you're uncommon perlite sir looking at the countess's brother which as much surprise as gratitude but tell me now said he we had appointed to meet a friend in a cabaret in this street and have perhaps mistaken the house in coming here this is the white rabbit at your service sir that's right enough then said thomas making a sign to sarah yes it was at the white rabbit that he was to give us the meeting there are not two white rabbits in this street said the ogress with a toss of her head but what sort of a person was your friend tall slim and with hair and moustaches of light chestnut said satan exactly exactly that's the man who has just gone out a charcoal man very tall and stout came in and said a few words to him and they left together the very man we want to meet said tom were they alone here inquired sarah why the charcoal man only came in for one moment but your comrade supped here with the chourineur and goualeuse and with a nod of her head the ogress pointed out the individual of the party who was left still in the cabaret thomas and sarah turned towards the chourineur after contemplating him for a few minutes sarah said in english to her companion do you know this man no Carl lost all trace of rodolph at the entrance of these obscure streets seeing murphy disguised as a charcoal seller keeping watch about this cabaret and constantly peeping through the windows he was afraid that something wrong was going on and so he came to warn us murphy no doubt recognized him during this conversation held in a very low tone and in a foreign tongue the schoolmaster said to the chouette looking at tom and sarah the swell has shelled out a bowl to the ogress it is just twelve rains and blows like the devil when they leave the crib we will be on their lay and draw the flat of his blunt as his mot is with him he'll hold his jaw 
if tom and sarah had heard this foul language they would not have understood it and would not have detected the plot against them be quiet pauline answered the chouette if the call sings out for the traps i have my vitriol in my pocket and will break the file in his patter-box nothing like a drink to keep children from crying she added tell me darling shan't we lay hands on pegriotte the first time we meet her and only let me once get her to our place and i'll rub her chops with my vitriol and then my lady will no longer be proud of her fine skin well said chouette i shall make you my wife some day or other said the schoolmaster you have no equal for skill and courage on that night with the cattle dealer i had an opportunity of judging of you and i said here's the wife for me she works better than a man and you said right pauline if the skeleton had had a woman like me at his elbow he would not have been nabbed with his gully in the dead man's weasand he's done up and now he will not leave the stone jug except to kiss the headman's daughter and be a head shorter what strange language these people talk said sarah who had involuntarily heard the last few words of the conversation between the schoolmaster and the chouette then she added pointing to the chourineur if we ask this man some questions about rodolphe perhaps he may be able to answer them we can but try replied thomas who said to the chourineur comrade we expected to find in this cabaret a friend of ours he supped with you i find perhaps as you know him you will tell us which way he has gone i know him because he gave me a precious good hiding two hours ago to prevent me from beating goualeuse and have you never seen him before never we met by chance in the alley which leads to bras rouge's house hostess another bottle of the best said thomas satan sarah and he had hardly moistened their lips and their glasses were still full but mother ponice doubtless anxious to pay proper respect to her own cellar had frequently filled and emptied hers and put it on the table where that gentleman sits if he will permit said thomas who with sarah seated themselves beside the chourineur who was as much astonished as flattered by such politeness the schoolmaster and the chouette were talking over their own dark plans in low tones and flash language the bottle being brought and sarah and her brother seated with the chourineur and the ogress who had considered a second invitation as superfluous the conversation was resumed you told us my good fellow that you met our comrade rodolph in the house where bras rouge lives inquired thomas satan as he hob and nobbed with the chourineur yes my good fellow replied he as he emptied his glass at a gulp what a singular name is bras rouge what is this bras rouge il pastique la maltouze smuggles said the chourineur in a careless tone and then added this is jolly good wine mother ponice if you think so do not spare it my fine fellow said satan and he filled the chourineur's glass as he spoke your health mate said he and the health of your little friend who but mum if my aunt was a man she'd be my uncle as the proverb says ah oh, you sly rogue i'm up to you sarah coloured slightly as her brother continued i did not quite understand what you meant about bras rouge rodolphe came from his house no doubt i told you that bras rouge pastique la maltouze thomas regarded the chourineur with an air of surprise what do you mean by pastique la mal uh, what do you call it pastique la maltouze he smuggles i suppose you would call it but it seems you can't patter flash my fine fellow i don't understand one word you say i see you can't talk slang like monsieur rodolphe slang said thomas satan looking at sarah with an astonished air ah you are yokels but comrade rodolph is an out-and-out -out pal he is though only a fan painter yet he is as downy in flash as i am myself well since you can't speak this very fine language i'll tell you in plain french that bras rouge is a smuggler and besides that has a small tavern in the champs elysees i say without breaking faith that he is a smuggler for he makes no secret of it but owns it under the very nose of the custom-house officers find him out though if you can bras rouge is a deep one what could rodolph want at the house of this man asked sarah 
really sir or madam which you please i know nothing about anything as true as i drink this glass of wine i was chaffing to-night with the goualeuse who thought i was going to beat her and she ran up bras rouge's alley and i after her it was as dark as the devil instead of hitting goualeuse however i stumbled on master rodolphe who soon gave me better than i sent such thumps and especially those infernal thwacks with his fist at last my eyes how hot and heavy they did fall but he's promised to teach me and to and bras rouge what sort of a person is he asked tom what goods does he sell bras rouge oh by the holy he sells everything he is forbidden to sell and does everything which is forbidden to do that's his line ain't it mother ponice oh he's a boy with more than one string to his bow answered the ogress he is besides principal occupier of a certain house in the rue du temple a rum sort of a house to be sure but mum added she fearing to have revealed too much and what is the address of bras rouge in that street asked satan of the chourineur number thirteen sir perhaps we may learn something there said satan in a low voice to his sister i will send karl thither to-morrow as you know monsieur rodolphe said the chourineur you may boast the acquaintance of a stout friend and a good fellow if it had not been for the charcoal man he would have doubled up the schoolmaster who is there in the corner with the chouette by the lord i can hardly contain myself when i see that old hag and know how she behaved to the goualeuse but patience a blow delayed is not a blow lost as the saying is the hotel de ville clock struck midnight the lamp of the tavern only shed a dim and flickering light except the chourineur and his two companions the schoolmaster and the screech owl all the guests of the tapis franc had retired one after the other the schoolmaster said in an undertone to the chouette if we go and hide in the alley opposite we shall see the swells come out and know which road they take if they turn to the left we can double upon them at the turning of the rue saint edouard if to the right we will wait for them by the ruins close to the tripe market there's a large hole close by and i have a capital idea the schoolmaster and the chouette then went towards the door you won't then take a drain of nothing to-night said the ogress no mother ponice we only came in to take shelter from the rain said the schoolmaster as he and the chouette went out End of chapter six